Down the Barrel Podcast with Jimmy and Dino. Get ready to dive into the wild world of Minnesota hunting, trapping, and wildlife. We'll be chatting with some folks who protect, manage, and promote the great outdoors. But don't worry, we'll also have some laughs as we chat about guns, whiskey, and anything else that catches our eye. So grab a drink, sit back, and get ready for a good time. Down the Barrel Podcast is brought to you by the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association and Wolf.Report. Wolf.Report, a platform dedicated to elevating the voices of Minnesota hunters, trappers, and outdoor enthusiasts. Join us in advocating for responsible wolf management in Minnesota. Share your reports, photos, and stories, and together we will ensure that they are seen by all. The Minnesota Deer Hunters Association, protecting the future of deer and deer hunting through habitat, education, advocacy, and legislation. Minnesota Deer Hunters Association and Wolf Dot Report proudly sponsor this podcast. However, please note that the opinions, topics, and guests featured may not necessarily align with the views, beliefs, goals, or mission of our sponsors. Welcome to the next episode of Down the Barrel. I'm your host, Jimmy. And I'm Dino. And today we're talking with Executive Director of MDHA, Jared Mazurek. How are you doing, Jared? I'm good. How are you guys? Good. Not good. too bad. Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Thanks for well, coming. Yeah, exactly. Thanks for coming in. We were a brave soul. Yeah, exactly. We've been kind of waiting on this and, uh, and I think it'll be really good. We might even get a few more listeners because we have somebody smarter than us on here. Right. We did say we were going to get some smart people on here. Yeah. So you are smart, right, Jared? Uh, that's for you to decide. <laughs> well, well. You, could, you do have some kind of education, right? I Probably more than us. Oh, I well, definitely more than Dean. <laughs> that's for sure. But in Kansas, you know, sixth grade is pretty high. Hey, I went to college, not in Kansas. I went to Wyoming. That's even worse, I think. I don't know about that. There's like four people in Wyoming. <laughs> is it 65. 65 people? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. It's twice the size of my graduating class. <laughs> yeah. I'm big four. <laughs> it's nothing wrong. Big four. Go Huskies. <laughs> Anyway, back to Jared. Hey, Jared. So, uh, you're originally from Minnesota, aren't you? I am, yeah. Whereabouts? I grew up in a small town called Mound. Uh, I've heard of that. Yeah, Lake yeah. Minnetonka area. Not oh. Mound to you. Mound. Is that oh, okay. cake eater country? It oh, is. It's but, pretty close. But Mound is, is the town around Lake Minnetonka that Lake Minnetonka wishes wasn't there. Oh, <laughs> so you're the other side of the tracks. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, went to Mound West Tonka High School. Go... Whitehawks. Whitehawks. White there you go. <laughs> we, used racist. The, we used to be the Mohawks. We had to change it. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. We used to be the Indians here in town back in 95. Yeah. You know, you we know what's, that. you know, you keep talking bad about Kansas, but you know what? My town is still the Indians. We didn't change. Yeah. Well, and, and we get, care. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, you care. But guess what? what? Although they're not from, okay, I'll say this. They're not from Kansas. But it is Kansas City, the Chiefs. Yeah, I think they're going to lose today. Oh, you shut your mouth. I talked to a kid at uh, Ace Hardware today, and he's rooting for the Niners. I don't care about the kid from and, Ace Hardware. And he said that, and I was walking away, and some other older guy like my age came up to me. He's like, old guy. That's uh, that's good to see. And I wasn't sure what the heck he was talking about. <laughs> I don't know if he's a Niners fan or if he's like, oh, man, that young kid actually likes football. But I, I was like, uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, I'm guessing it was more of a like football. I mean, but- honestly, I don't know who to root for because you're going for Chiefs. My brother-in-law, Matt's going for the Niners because he's from L.A. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll have to go to Chiefs because they're more Midwest, I guess. Is, they is are that more, considered Midwest? They are a Midwest team, honestly. Really? They really are. So who are you going for? Yeah. No, it doesn't matter. No one's wearing purple. I agree with Jared. Oh, I agree with Jared. I, yeah. Their both teams are wearing red. and uh, uh, Red and then Niners have a – they've got a different red. Oh, it's a different red. Yeah, it's like they crimson. Are from San it's pretty much like crimson, so it's almost the same color so it's like as like roll tide you know, roll or tide. What? Yeah, pretty oh. close. Some 49ers fan are going to hate us for that one, but that's all right. Yeah, I don't think we're going to get any listeners from California, I don't think. Probably not. i got a couple friends out there. They might listen. Yeah. But anywho, Super Bowl today. Yeah. Yeah. We'll probably watch it later. But anyways, (laughs) we're here to talk to Jared. I know. Sorry, Jared. 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 So back to your bio. Um, So yeah, originally from? Mound. Yep. Mound, Minnesota. Went to high school. Then where'd you go? Yeah. Yeah. um, I moved out to Colorado. I did my undergrad at the University of Denver. Go Pios. <laughs> and then uh, worked for a little bit uh, and then went back to school, got my master's in education at Colorado College. 
Oh, cool. Um, and lived out there for. Wow. You got a master's degree. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Lived out there for 13, 14 years. Okay. Um, yeah. I was working for environmental education centers out there. Oh, gotcha. Um, yeah. Doing a lot of, you know, getting kids outside, getting them connected to the, to the outdoors. Uh, worked a lot with Pheasants Forever, Trout Unlimited, um, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers for, you know, summer camps, things like that. But, okay. But really trying to get kids, uh, the next generation. That's awesome. Um, to spend time outside and, and get involved in hunting and fishing and conservation. Yeah, yeah definitely. So pretty similar to MDHA's Four Corn Camps and their you know what they do very similar yeah yeah okay so that is that is not new to uh to my life um, right. actually my first job right out of high school was was uh camp counselor for four corn camps oh really where yeah. at at baker at that time it was baker near wilderness settlement in, okay in maple plain i think they've changed the name now but yeah they used baker outdoor yeah. learning center i yeah. want to say or is that down like by that. the cities or something it is yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. so maple plains 10 minutes from mount <laughs> gotcha so gotcha well that's cool so you've actually had a background more or less with mdha for many many years and then with the education and rotating in the four corn and stuff like that so well that's pretty cool i guess um a lot of people probably don't know that but i didn't know that yeah so you were in Colorado and you stayed out there for years. Um, you met your wife out there, I'm assuming? No, she is also from Mount. Um, oh, wow. Grew up across the bay from me. So in the winter, it was actually quicker for me to ski across the bay than to, to drive to her house. But nice. Yeah, so we are, we're high school sweethearts. Wow. Um, yeah. Oh, that's cool. She still likes you? Well, that's that's a stretch. But <laughs> it's questionable. She tolerates me. Well, there you go. Hey, that's pretty there good. Go. Yeah, still I've been married a long time. time. <laughs> Well, for now. <laughs> anyway, so you're in Colorado, and um, I saw a picture of you online. I was I was doing some stalking, and you're standing in a, a stream with a net. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Uh, there's like some article out of Colorado, and it's a picture of oh, Jared Masaryk. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm assuming you were working with some organization, doing yeah. some kind of sampling or so something. So that, that picture, I was at that time working with the Pooter Learning Center. I was the executive director there. Um, and that was an, another environmental ed center, but we hosted the Colorado Children's Water Festival. Um, okay. So it was for fourth and fifth grade students. Um, I think we had, oh man, 2,400 kids that day. Oh, wow. wow. Come to our, to our site and learn all about water. Anything from water use to water conservation to um, how to measure water quality. And so that picture, I was actually in the, the Poudre River uh, collecting macroinvertebrates, which can be used as a proxy for m- water quality. Um, okay. So you basically, you're, you're trying to identify these different, um, do you know, macroinvertebrate? Dean yes. definitely does. Dude, I can't even spell <laughs> invertebrate. <laughs> well, so they're, they're bugs, basically. They're okay. Bugs who live in the water that you can see with your, your naked eye. Um, but basically the presence of certain species of these macroinvertebrates um, and the abundance of those species can tell you how how clean um, the water, the water, right. the water okay. is. So I think they made me sick once in the boundary waters. <laughs> that was probably the beavers. I definitely had beaver fever. That's what my doctor said. <laughs> that's crazy. Did lose a few pounds, though. That was nice. Well, that's a good weight loss program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pleasant. Anyway, that's awesome. So well, that's pretty cool. I guess I... Uh, never really knew that um so then obviously you know you were in colorado for a few years and then you came back to minnesota for mdha i did oh that's pretty cool why well um a couple of reasons one like i mentioned i uh I started my my education and, and conservation career with with MDHA uh, as a counselor for Four Corn Camps. So I've yep. always, you know, kept tabs on, right. on what so MDHA familiar. is up to you and and saw the position open and it, it just seemed like a natural fit for me. And you wanted um, to come back to Minnesota, right? And I wanted to come back to Minnesota because yeah. my wife and I were expecting twins. And, oh, that's cool. And my family, her family, is here, and we didn't really want to do this alone like we did with our first son. Right. Um, so yeah, it was a win win. You know get back back to family back to my roots and in a, a great position with a an amazing organization yeah that's awesome i mean so, other than dean I mean. <laughs> right <laughs> so so you got hired in more or less december of 2022 20, yes yes yeah so right and after then, covid right or was that during covid 
Uh, pretty much after COVID. Is it? Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, kind of the year after. And then so you got hired in December, uh, more or less, and then sight unseen, bought your house, and then moved your whole family out here when your wife is expecting just in the next two months or a month, really. Yeah, I mean, so, kind of crazy. Sight unseen. I, yeah. We did we did Facetime with the okay. realtor while she walked through the house. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, that's and, pretty cool though. Yeah, you know, it, it worked out. We love yeah. the place, and awesome. And it's a it's a great great area to live in. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, we we sure do like having you here. So, um, you know, get back to Jimmy saw a picture of you in a creek, and I've seen a picture. Obviously, it's been kind of floating around of you with an elk. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm a obviously assuming that it was out in Colorado um, was, can you tell us a little bit about that experience and hunting of elk? Obviously we don't get hunt elk here in Minnesota you know. every year, but I never get it. Right. So yeah. tell us a little bit about any hunting that you did even in Colorado. Yeah. Yeah. Well, out in Colorado, um, I was always after elk and, and mule deer. Um, Cause I was living up in the mountains. All the white tails are out in the Eastern part of the state, which I, I did pheasant hunt out there, but never, never big game hunted. Um, so that elk, I'm assuming the picture you saw was, oh, it must have been 2017 or 18. Um, and unlike Minnesota and, you know, most states, it's it's all lottery, right, yeah. for big game yep. hunting. So it's not a guarantee that you're going to get a tag every year. Um, but the area I was in, which was Woodland Park, Colorado, um, right on the the north slope of pikes peak my wife and i were running another education center at that time on about 200 acres surrounded by pike national forest um and so i was hunting the national forest on on pikes peak and i was able to get an over-the-counter third rifle season so a a late season um bull elk tag yeah because there was snow in that picture i do remember oh yeah it was cat four feet of fresh powder (laughs) and i was about seven miles from the truck when i shot that thing hunting by myself Um, wow yeah it was a it was a it was a process but (laughs) it was a it was a nice six by six bull elk yeah it looked nice by far the nicest i've ever i've ever taken um so were you considered a resident then so i was yeah yeah so it's a little easier probably to get a tag oh yeah i mean i think my elk tag was maybe pushing fifty dollars i tried to get my dad to come out and hunt with me one year and his out-of-state tag would have been like 800. oh wow (laughs) yeah i mean heck when i hunted in (laughs) illinois for whitetail it was like I guess it was only by six, seven hundred. Yeah, and so I think uh, out of state tags, depending on in Kansas, which um, whether archery or rifle depends right. on the price. But I want to say archery, you know, five hundred bucks. Yeah, it was right around five hundred when I checked. There. Rifle wasn't too much. But then they have that other. You got to buy a license and then a permit. I, that that's different than Minnesota, where you just it buy is. a license. Correct. Yeah, out there you have to have a hunting license, which is typically around a hundred dollars, and then you have to buy the the hunting permit right which yeah. is the same in illinois yep, too. the tag more or less so yeah yep yeah a little bit different everywhere we go so was that the only elk you've taken i mean that's pretty impressive though yeah that is pretty impressive you still have the rack i do it's it's above the fireplace right now really cool. yeah nice yeah it's it's uh definitely my my prized trophy well, well yeah i'm not a trophy by hunter by any means well no but. I definitely hung on to that one. Uh, I yeah. some good meat. You, you eat all that meat, or is it you still have some, or is it all gone? No, I ate it all. Oh, oh, that was a few years ago, so well, I, I hope it hope it I was all right. right. <laughs> no, I don't know. Was, I've never gotten it. I know either. there's a lot of meat. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I've helped with some moose, but I've never got to do elk, so... Yeah, no, it was a it was a good process. I did the Euro mount myself in a in a horse cool. trough over a campfire. <laughs> nice. That was about a three day process. Yeah, sweet. So Seven. did you have to pack it out? I did. I was gonna say seven miles. That that's a dude, lot I, of work. I can't even walk like a a mile. Well, yeah, to uh, even run out of breath. Yeah, well. your last big deer we drug out with a four ruler. Yeah, we did. Yeah, <laughs> that was I was hard. I was a little bit younger and in shape at that point. Yeah, three kids later, and yeah, I couldn't do that today. <laughs> right, oh, man. I no doubt I would die for sure, <laughs> especially in the mountains. I mean, seven miles. Yeah, there's no oxygen you know, elevate. Elevation yeah. difference, I'm assuming, would have you know played a big part in everything. Oh yeah, too. I mean, my house was at ten thousand oh, feet. Right, <laughs> um, I was up at oh probably about twelve thousand when I. Yeah, that's crazy. crazy. I was, last time I was in Aspen, just walking across the parking lot to go to the restaurant, <laughs> I literally had to take a break. There is no oxygen in that place. <laughs> I was heading out to Moab and we stopped there, and I was like, man, we have to leave this place. Have you been to a uh, Pikes Peak area? 
no, but I, I mean, I've seen a lot of videos from there and it's a cool area. It looks like, I mean, obviously yeah, races, no, that's, I but. used to, I've got family out in, uh, Colorado. So Denver, Pueblo, Colorado Springs. So we used to go out there, you know, pretty much every other year and I actually rode the cog rail <laughs> up Pikes Peak or on the backside. I remember which way it went, but that was, that was pretty cool. And then I, uh, my folks and I, we stayed at uh, Lake George one time and yeah. and did a lot of walking around. There's a lot of trails and everything. And we actually got lost on a, uh, a hiking trip. So we took a hiking trip with this guide service. I don't remember the name right now, um, but it was just my folks and I. And it was only supposed to be like a two hour hike. You know, go on this trail, you go up the mountain a little bit, you come back down, they pick you up. We got lost. <laughs> So a two hour hiking trip turned into like six hours and uh, yeah, they were, and of course there's no cell service and I believe the gal had a radio, um, but couldn't get enough reception. So we took some other trails and this old donkey um, mining trail that they took along the side of the mountain, which let me tell you, it was about as wide, it was about a foot wide all rock and then a steep cliff, you know, going down like 400 feet. It was absolutely ridiculous. And here we're walking across that. But anyways, long story short, we did get out. But let me tell you, that is some of the most beautiful area in that Lake George. I love Colorado Springs, Pueblo. Yep. You know, I that's gorgeous. Garden of the Gods. Yeah. You know, all that. I, I love going out to Colorado. Yeah. yeah I rock cool. climbed a lot, a lot out there. Oh, that's cool. Rock climbing. God, yeah. that would be that would so. be tough. Yeah, well, Eleven Mile Canyon, right outside of Lake George. There, okay, um, yeah, that was my go-to spot. I actually I had my bachelor party in Eleven Mile Canyon. Oh, cool! We climbed rocks and anybody died. Did, did other things. That night. <laughs> nobody died. No, nobody died. Well, that's good. Usually, yeah, that's a plus. bachelor parties, <laughs> alcohol. Yeah, I'm assuming cliffs. Not a good mix. <laughs> so, all right. So we've got. So you've hunted. Yeah, elk. So, yeah. So you've hunted whitetail. Elk. Yeah, how about whitetail? How about Minnesota whitetail? Yeah, so growing up, um, my dad actually, it's one of his hobbies, and I think, I'm hoping it's still his retirement plan. Uh, he trains golden retrievers for oh, cool. pheasant, pheasant hunting. Yeah. Um, he's very good at it. Um, we've always had golden since before I was born. Um, so growing up, it was mostly pheasant hunting was okay. what I did. Yep. Um, we did still, we whitetail hunted every year as well. Um, we have a, my family owns a property right outside of Brainerd, uh, okay. Pillager area. Yeah. So that's where I grew up hunting. Still, I, I took a deer there this year. Nice. Um, yeah. And so, but growing up, uh, it was mostly, mostly upland game, you know, okay. uh, pheasant hunting. And then I really didn't get super into big game hunting until I moved to Colorado. And so it was all elk and, and mule deer out there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, getting back into the white tails back here in Minnesota. Um, I have, I have shot white tail deer. Nice. Well, that's good. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you said mule deer. Um, did you ever get any mule deer? I, I have. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, um, that elk I was talking about, that would have been, could have been the best mule deer I, I had ever taken. It was a big, mature 12 point mule deer, um, but it was skylined on this ridge. And so I was waiting for it to come my side of the ridge so I could, I could take this animal. Um, but he went to the other side, of course. So I scrambled up to the top and I started glassing and that's when I saw that six by six bull elk. So I took that instead. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. That's cool. I can't yeah. imagine. Well, you know, a little bit, you know, with your history, kind of with mine too, um, you know, I didn't really do a whole lot of big game hunting until I moved to Minnesota. Um, we did bird and, you know, my dad had shot plenty of deer, you know, back in the day, obviously being on the ranch and whatnot. <laughs> so I didn't really, by the time I was old enough, I didn't really get the opportunity as much. Um, and then when I moved up here, got an archery, thanks to Jim, yep. you know, got an archery hunting and really love that. And, um, and then obviously I go back to Kansas, like I alluded to in the last one, you know, and, and I've been lucky enough to harvest a nice couple bucks there with, uh, with my bow and, and whatnot. So, so that's kind of cool that, you know, you started out not necessarily big game hunting, but then got into it, you know, even on Colorado, then back here still getting uh, white tail deer and stuff. So that's, that's pretty neat. Yeah. That's cool. How that happens. Right. Anyone can start at any time in their life. Oh, for sure. Right. That's what we're here for. Right. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. To... I think more people need to do that. 
Oh, exactly. Exactly. I mean, it's, you know, and nowadays there's not as much, you know, entry to barriers, what, you know, maybe there used to be, you know, there's still a lot of public land out there, you know, where people can go hunt. Um, you know, you can buy a rifle, you know, a, a decent deer rifle for pretty much under, you know, 500 bucks. Oh, nowadays, easy. Yeah. You know, and 300 get, bucks. Yeah, exactly. And get a savage, you know, access, right. you know, regular access or even a savage access to, right. you know, for definitely under 500. Um, and those are a good way to start out. And there's so many calibers for, you know, people learning to hunt. Yeah, like the 6.5. Like the six five. That's beginner you know, rifle. That is a really nice caliber. You know, light, light recoil. Um, you know, a little bit more than two forty three, but you know, a lot of a lot of guys use that round. Well, Jared, don't you, you shoot a six five? Right, I was I was hoping this would come up. I listened to your last episode. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, well, at least one of them. Somebody right. did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. I, I will not deny it. I own a six five, but it's not the only rifle I own. No, I shot a six five once. My sister bought it from me. Are you telling me you don't own one? <laughs> I do not own a 6.5. Do you, do you own a 6.5? I don't own a 6.5. How is that even possible? I think it's because it's we're old. We are old. And That's that true. wasn't around when I was younger. So no. I, I, I don't I don't get it. Well, yeah, I, it's it's a new it's a new right, cartridge. Right. 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 Although it's, it's based on an old cartridge, isn't it? It is. It's yeah. based off the 6.5 Grandel. Which I, I've never shot that I, either. I never heard of I it, did honestly, until the 6.5 Creedmoor came out. And it seems like a, it's a snappy round. I know that. It is. It's fast, flat shooting. It's, right. it's, it's a great. I don't even know what it compares to, honestly. Oh, there's so much debate. I don't even know if we have time to get into it. But <laughs> honestly, you Watch could come on Spelmer video. Uh, he'll, right, he'll, he'll cover it. <laughs> you you could compare it. You know, six five to three oh eight in a really? in a certain version. Um, but a lot of the six five guys now as well. Six five is a great long distance. A lot of the long distance guys. I mean, these guys are shooting six, seven, eight, you know, thousand yards. They're using the Creedmoor six okay. five Creedmoor because it uh, it is so flat shooting, low recoil. So you can get back on you know back on target really quick, um, and it's you know less wind resistance. And then it's even got its point of impact um, that is just crazy. I don't I mean, know. The really six nice five I shot was pretty snappy. I mean, I felt it in my shoulder. Yeah. I mean, it was snappy. It didn't. It didn't hurt at all. It wasn't much of a push, but it was snappy. Yeah, it is snappy, but it's only got. I want to say, um, don't quote me on this. Um, about let's just say thirteen foot pounds to whether the two forty three has fourteen. Hmm. Actually, I think it's less than that. I want to say it's actually oh, eleven and thirteen. Recoil. Yeah, recoil. Yeah. Yep. Yep. To where I shoot a two seventy. Um, most of the time I do have a 308, uh, but I do shoot a 270. I want to say that's like 16. And then your 308 is right around there. And I want to say the 30 out six is running 18 right, or right. maybe 19, maybe actually 30 out six might be over 20. Don't quote me because I, I don't have any figures in front of me um, right now, but that's oh, pretty much the equivalent. We're going to hold you to it. You should hold me to it. Well, I can tell you, I, I also have a 30 out six. There we go. It's a, it's a cheap budget rifle. I bought it in college so I could elk hunt. Um, but yeah, it's a Remington model 783. So it's a, it's a budget rifle, but I want a 30 out six. You can have mine. That's what my dad hunts I'm with. He's all he has. <laughs> I love those old calibers like that. But no, I shoot that six five, and then I shoot the the thirty out six, and it's, I would say, at least five times more recoil. Oh yeah, yeah. I love that. I sure. love being punished. Yeah. yeah. Seriously. Well, yeah, I love. That. That's why I shoot that four fifty to that seven is, MMA. Yeah, but that four fifty wasn't bad. No, that four fifty is actually pretty good. Yeah. I don't stick to any one caliber. I'm four fifty three oh eight seven MMA. You name it, I'm probably shooting it. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm carrying it. I'm not really shooting him a whole lot. Right. That's about the range. Yeah, that's for sure. Although that 50 cal killed a few deer last year. No, year before. Year before. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah, that was, that was pretty cool. Um, so yeah, well, why don't we? Uh, why don't we take a quick break? Minnesota Deer Hunters Association has been building our hunting and conservation legacy over the past 40 plus years through habitat, education, advocacy, and legislation in Minnesota for Minnesota. Welcome back. <laughs> Welcome back. All right. Yeah, that we're was back. Brilliant. That, that was brilliant. That, that, was, that was a good transition. That was a good transition. So we're back. Uh, Jimmy and Dean here and our lovely guest, Jared. Lovely. From MBJ, so lovely. Lovely. Yeah. I don't that's know why nice. I said lovely, that's, but that's nice. Yeah. I'm telling Chris. Our smart, awesome guest, Jared. 
Right. Yeah. Educated. Right. Educated. There educated. we go. Educated. So word on the street is, at least from uh, Certain. social media, yeah. um, is you potentially uh, nothing against the DNR, but are a spy for the DNR uh, and you infiltrated MDHA. Is that actually been said on social media? Oh, yeah. Many, many times. Oh, I think that'd be hard to believe considering you just came from Colorado, but I don't know. Right. I would too. So I guess, what do you say? Yeah, who do you know in the DNR, Jared? Oh, I, I, I know a lot of people in the DNR and uh, I don't really know what to think about this question. <laughs> it's kind of an odd question. <laughs> I know some CEO officers. I met a few of them. They don't like me. Yeah. Are you a spy? Yeah. Am I a spy? Um, Are you pushing the DNR's agenda? No. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that means. I yeah, mean, I that means. In, in my understanding of what it means to be a spy, right? You're gathering intelligence and you're reporting back. You're right? in the wrong spot if you're gathering intelligence from this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess in, in some sense of the word spy, sure, I'm a spy for the DNR. I knew it. You know? Yep. Yeah, I travel all around the state. I talk to MDHA members. I talk to hunters. I talk to conservationists. I hear their concerns. I hear what they want to see. Right. And yeah, I report those report back it. to the DNR. Right. And I say this is what needs to happen. Right. So, and they always listen to you. Definition. They always listen to you. I know it. <laughs> oh, 100%. Right. Every 100%. time. You, you make the rules. I get it. Yeah. 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 Commissioner Stroman, uh, before she makes any decision, she calls me. She calls I knew you. it. I knew yep. it. Yep. No. Yep. So, no, I wish that was the case. But, right. That'd be easier. But yeah, I mean, no, I'm, I'm not a spy for the DNR, <laughs> but I do take the concerns of our members, the hunters, the conservationists in the state. And yeah, I bring them to the, to the DNR. Yeah. Well, I think that's and the I point, isn't it? This is what needs to happen. And yeah, like you said, this, that's the point of right. right. DHA. Well, and then, and then with that, you know, you are on quite a few <clears throat> committees. boards or committees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe committees, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I'm on the deer advisory committee, um, which is probably the, the most influential, influential and, yep. and relevant committee that I'm on. What do they do? Um, so we, we advise on, on really anything relating to deer management, um, whether that be wolves, uh, harvest, harvest numbers. Um, I mean, you name it, you know, if, if they're debating on whether or not to change a bucks only zone to either okay. sex or, you know, just a standard unlimited zone. Um, Any chance we can get baiting on private land? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, that's that's a good question. They used uh, to have baiting in Minnesota, you know, back in like seventies, I think. Yeah, legally, legally, yeah, just like yeah. down in Kansas, like you. Yep. Yeah, you know where you cheat. I, it's, it's not <laughs> cheating. It's not baiting. <laughs> yeah, you guys bait. <laughs> that, that's another episode. Let's talk to Jim. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> well, no, that's all right. I, baiting, I, I, that's not a that's not a hill I'm going to die on. No, you know, it's it's never going to happen again. I'm really right, going to push right for it now. <laughs> Right now, we're fighting just for winter deer feeding, you know? Yeah, right. right. Which I fully back. And uh, I feel bad because I can't winter feed this year because of uh, the area I'm in. Right. Right. Well, with that, MDHA obviously got to start because of, right. you know, the bad winter. So many in a row, deer, you know, dying and got to start by pushing for the deer. Saving the deer. Winter deer feeding. Yeah, it was, so yeah, rough it was pretty back much saving the deer. Whenever 80s, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 No, we, we started the, the winter deer feeding program. Right. The, the reason you pay 50 cents on your deer license is, is for what well, originally was for winter deer feeding. Right. right. Um, yep. And that was because of MDHA. Yep. Right. That has since changed uh, with the arrival of CWD in the state. Right. And, and so, that's why I can't help the deer out in my area because of the CWD risk. Correct. correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Although this, this winter was actually very easy on the deer, so I don't feel that bad. Yeah, for sure. And I think um, I think we'll bring up CWD a little bit later in another episode. I think that... Are you, you afraid know, of that? Are you afraid of that issue, Dean? No, not at this time. CWD. I think we have other stuff to, to cover other than that. I think that should be a later... Yeah. That I could be a whole condition by itself, oh, honestly. Oh, it, I'm sure it will be at some point. Yeah, but. because right now, obviously, the main thing in front of everybody's eyes and, and ears is uh, wolf management. Yeah, that's crazy. You know, I just actually got a 
let me see if I can reach it here. Uh, I think in the mail the other day. Can you help? There we go. Thank you. Um, Congressman Pete Stauber fighting for responsible wolf management of the gray wolf. So this is a nice little piece of mail I got. Um, so wolf management, responsible wolf management of Minnesota. How long is, you know, what's MDHA's take on that? How long have they been working on that? What is, you know, MDHA stance? Because I do remember last year we put some out about um, wolf management as well. So I know that's like three questions in a one, but uh, go ahead and we'll, we'll let you talk about it. Yeah. I mean, wolf management has been, I think, the, the base at which MDHA has grown into other issues um, since we started in 1980 return or delisting the gray wolf and returning management to the state of Minnesota has been number one on our list of, of legislative priorities. Um, that has not changed, uh, through any of the executive directors we've had over the years. Um, definitely not under my tenure. Um, we want to see the, the wolf delisted at the federal level and we want a wolf season in Minnesota. Um, yeah, uh, because it has to be delisted on the federal level for us in Minnesota to be able to have a wolf season, correct? Correct. Okay. Yes. This is this is a federal issue. We've gotten them delisted a number of times. We had very successful wolf hunts in Minnesota from 2012 to 2014. Yeah, that's right. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the, the DNR, they manage it, it very well. Um, they got hour by hour updates right. on, on wolf harvest numbers. I do remember that, yeah, because it was like all of a sudden um, they wanted you to register right away and right. we ended up the harvest number was again, don't quote me on numbers uh, let's just say 300 and and they was it like a week or a two week um, hunting season and they filled that within yeah. days. You had to like call in before you went on hunting, I yeah, believe, and they to get the numbers and I want to say hunt. they ended up harvesting more than what they actually I think they did get a few extras. Quota was supposed to slightly. slightly. Yeah, not much, but just a few. But they controlled it, I think, within just a few hours. So, I mean, yeah. they were they were, they were on top of it. And that was trapping and hunting, correct? Correct. Back then, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I tried to get in on that. That was tough. Yeah. Yeah. And so we want to see that come back, right? And uh, um, other states, so the, the West or the northern rocky mountain states in the western u.s so okay. uh wyoming uh, idaho parts of washington and montana, montana. Um, they still have a wolf season because they were able to su to successfully delist the wolf and have a provision in that in that delisting that prohibited judicial review so basically the courts could not overturn their decision to delist the wolves minnesota has never had that so we delist the wolf and then the courts there's some lawsuit filed the courts take up that lawsuit and end up getting them back on the endangered species list. And, is it, and isn't that because minnesota's always had wolves where some of the other states they were uh rain or is that correct that's definitely part of it okay right uh, minnesota is the only state in the lower 48 that has what we call an endemic um, population. We've always had wolves. They've, okay. they've never gone extinct in the state of Minnesota. Hmm. Every other state in the lower, every other state other than Alaska, they have gone, well, they've been extirpated there. Extirpation is a, a local extinction, right? That's crazy. Hmm. Right, so looking at this uh, Stauber flare that Dean got, Jared, um, I see it men mentions, uh, Trust the Science Act and Managing Predators Act. Do you know anything about those? Absolutely. So Trust the Science Act was introduced last year um, by Lauren Bobert out of Colorado of all places. <laughs> um, but yeah, basically the, the Trust the Science Act is, is saying just that, trust the science, trust the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that has said the gray wolf is fully recovered to its current habitable range in the United States. Return management back to the states, let them manage their own populations. And when I say current habitable range, that is, I, I think, in my opinion, the biggest issue at this point is we have these federal courts and we have these special interest groups like 
howling for wolves um, that like to use historical range for, right. for the right. people, which is a lot larger. It's it's everywhere. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, if, if we're going to use historical range as a metric of recovery for the gray wolf, well, we need wolf packs in downtown Minneapolis, downtown right. Chicago. And yeah. that's, that's just, well, I think in the same argument too, they say that uh, white-tailed deer shouldn't belong in Northern Minnesota too. And which, yeah, because they're an invasive species. Yeah, right. In and which is like, oh, fine and great, but uh, that's not the reality of today. Right. And we have to actually live in reality, so. Right. And that's why we use current habitable range, right? Right. Now, where is the habitat still suitable to support a population of the gray wolf right yeah and within that range they're fully recovered by every metric by every agency that deals with this and i know obviously the numbers are going to be controversial or you know i mean there's so many numbers floating around as to how many right. that there currently are um i want to say 2700 has been the you know, give a number to state that that's what it takes for us to be able to get a hunting season or for them to be delisted. Is that correct? Or Well, 2,700 is, is roughly the current population estimate in the state. Okay. Um, but U.S. Fish and Wildlife, when they set the recovery goal for the gray wolf in Minnesota, it was at 1,600. Oh, wow. And then the DNR bumped that up to nine. Uh, I might be mixing them up. I think U.S. Fish and Wildlife set 1,400 and, and DNR bumped it up to 16. Okay. Well, we're at 2,700. Right. So well above that target recovery number. Yeah. And according to some, obviously, we're well, lot more, well yeah. above that yeah. 2,700 at they, this right. point. Right. Potentially. And that's, right. that's my biggest question, you know, is we've been at 2,700 for, what, 20, 25 years now? Right. And the wolf range has been shown to be expanding but the population number has not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know how that could be possible. I think part of that is we're still using the same research methodology today as we were 25 years ago. Right. Well, technology has changed a lot oh, for in sure. that time frame. So it might be time to rethink how we're doing our wolf study. Yep. Um, and maybe where we're doing our wolf studies. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, I mean, we've seen reports from Detroit Lakes area, even Malacca. Right. You know, I just got area. a report today out of close to Park Rapids and that was um, obviously somebody had been recording these wolves for a while because some of the pictures were back to 2022. And uh, there was a lot of evidence of wolves over there. So they are definitely spreading. Yeah, where normally the wolf range, you know, potentially would be, you know, the iron range or anything at, north at, of Grand yeah, Rapids at best. farther south, you yeah. know, that's historical. I mean, right. Yeah, so know. that's that's kind of crazy within itself, you know. Um, but getting back to the Trust of Science Act and everything like that. So MDHA, obviously, you know, their big proponent is Trust of Science. You know, it seems like they don't get into, uh, you know, the the negative end or the misinformation to where, you know, you guys as MDHA want to stay in, you know, the correct numbers and stay with the science, you know, so can you elaborate a little bit on, on that end of it? Well, yeah, I mean, I hear every day, you know, that, well, I think there's 10,000 wolves in the state of Minnesota. I think there's 6,000 in the state of Minnesota and there, there very well could be right. Um, however, MDHA, we pride ourselves on sticking with the current accepted scientific understanding um, yeah. of wildlife management and, and populations, right. right? And that current understanding is the 27 to, I believe last year, that number did bump to 2,900. So 27 to 2,900 wolves. Yeah. That is the official estimate in the state of Minnesota. It could be way higher. But we as an organization are not going to come out and say it's not 27, 2900, right. it's 6,000. Right. Without any proof. Yeah, we're right. not going to say, well, the DNR is wrong. Yeah. It's, it's got to be triple that. Yeah, yeah. I'm right. assuming they must put some real effort in making that count. They, they do, right? right. And, and again, are their methods perfect? Probably not. Right. Especially if they haven't changed in so many years. I mean, right. 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 So there's got to be some update there, I would imagine. Well, with that, you know, that is where um, Wolf Report 
Jimmy comes right. into play. Well, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt at all because right. we can obviously, you know, with Wolf Report, with, you know, the people sightings. Right. Um, you we, can definitely see the expanded range for sure. Oh, for sure. Because if it wasn't for, honestly, Wolf Report, I would not even expect there to be wolves in Detroit Lakes, Wadena. Um, right. I used to travel that area quite a bit for work. Uh, yeah, Pine County. I mean, yeah, there's I would have never thought there were mm-hmm. wolves in that area. Um, so that's just kind of crazy. So that's where Wolf Report really, you know, really helps me just as a normal citizen, you know, right. like, to understand all that. Right. Um, so and then, you know, with Wolf Report, uh, you know, MDHA kind of backs Wolf Report as well. Yeah. Thank you, you very know? much. MDHA. Yeah, so and Wolf Report's powered by MDHA. For sure. Um, so that's pretty cool. So why do you believe in, in Wolf Report as well, Jared, or even why does MDHA believe in it, you know, as a, as a whole? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And really, like we talked about the, the methodology behind the, the DNR's official population estimates for the gray wolf, um, they're not perfect. Right. And there's always room for improvement. And we hear reports from hunters in the field all the time that, yeah. they're, you know, especially, you know, the, the far north part of the right. state, mm-hmm. that they're seeing more wolves or wolf sign than they are deer or deer tracks. And there's a lot of on Facebook posting, you know, a trail cam pr- picture of a wolf or, right. or I saw a bunch of wolves today and no deer. Well, what can we do with that? nothing right right you're, you're just you're screaming into the void it's not it's not really contributing at that point to the to the larger conversation to yeah. actual actual meaningful change so wolf report came in and said well let's aggregate this data these reports let's try to make meaning out of it let's try to map it geographically on on where and what hunters are seeing and then maybe we can do something about it and at, with as MDHA, we saw that platform and we said, that's something we can get behind because yeah. that's exactly what we need. We're hearing all of this, this, you know, um, behind closed doors feedback from hunters. But how do we get that to be represented in, somewhere visually yep. and meaningfully. And I think Wolf Wolf Report rose to the occasion and stepped in to fill that place. And, and that's why we are proud to support them. Yeah, no, that's perfect. I think that's a good, a good way to say it because, right. you know, everything again, yeah, you see it on all the social media and stuff. Well, that only goes so far. And then obviously one guy posts a picture and it gets, you know, 2000 views and a hundred likes and a few comments here and there, but at and then least, goes away and then goes away. Yeah. Because then somebody else posts, you know, Oh, here's a picture right. of my deer or here's a picture of what I saw or a rub or whatever. So it just, it disappears in, you know, in social media to where with Wolf Report, it's a website as well. Right. It's a um, database. It's a the database. Website. It's so storing that, all that information. Yeah. So that is really really neat and unique to be able to use that data right you know um and build that data because you know you do a few years of this you're really going to get a much clearer picture than just a few months that we have now yeah for sure yeah exactly and i i have been asked is is wolf report going to be able to archive data year by year absolutely so can you like wipe the map clean next year yeah, have absolutely. The 2023 map and then start mm-hmm. fresh. Now that we have that data, it's in a database. We can do whatever we want with that data. And, and that's why I love collecting it, you know, getting the, the location data, the photos, even though they're, you know, they're just trail cam photos, but that's proof. People believe that then. Right. Well, and the good thing is, is people are having trail cams out. 365 days a year now, right. you know, back in the day, you put your, <laughs> you put your trail cam out, you know, so if you're hunting rifle season, you're putting it out mid October, right. <laughs> beginning of October. And then you're pulling the data a week before you're going out opening day, Saturday, you're going out Thursday, pulling your, you know, your drive out of your camera right. to see what's around. Um, nowadays people are documenting, especially on private land, even public land, you know, they're having a lot in certain areas where you can't, where you can have, you know, your trail cams out. Um, people are documenting that all year round. So that's where this, you know, Wolf report just isn't, um, seasonal. 
Um, right. It can be used all year long and then seeing where these wolves are, you know, and being able to track them because obviously we all know deer move around, wildlife moves around everywhere we go. You know, they, they're not just staying in one spot specifically. So the nice thing is, is, you know, you will see the wolves come in and out of people's properties or, you know, certain areas um, along with obviously the deer population right. as well. So that's kind of the cool thing. I, I will be interested to see how many reports we get in, especially with trail cam, uh, with the cellular trail cam, see what we get in for, you know, the, the summer, you know, see what kind of reports and everything like that, especially yeah. even with this um, light winter that we've been, this oh, mild sure. winter that we've been having, I would love to see how the reports are. And, and not only will it, you know, show us a little bit of the picture into, you know, wolves, but even deer. You know, because I know at MDHA, we get a lot of reports of, you know, deer trail cam photos and stuff like that. So it'll be interesting to see how that even comes about right. with this mild winter that we're having. Yeah, and that's one thing I wanted to do is to overlap the data that Wolf Report gets with the DNR's data on the, the deer areas and take their numbers of, you know, harvest numbers and see if somehow we can you know see if our reports somehow work out with their deer area numbers to yeah. the, the various harvest take oh, for sure and yeah yep exactly no that would be i think that would be really cool i'm uh, glad you guys mdj are working on i say you guys um us as mdj are working on you know a lot of the wolf management and stuff and i know there's a big thing even last year um that went out about um you know governor's opener about MDHA pulling out of that for wolf management and Second Amendment, right? Second Amendment rights, right. yeah, as well. Mm-hmm. So that was that was a really, you know, that was probably in in my time, and even as an MDHA member for years. And Jimmy, you've been an MDHA member for years as well. Absolutely, that was probably one of the largest, or probably the largest. I don't know, largest is a term. I think it was probably the. I don't know how to say it, but the most recognizable thing, I was kind of surprised by it, honestly, you that you guys, you guys did it. I mean, yeah. it was taking a stance and I mean, obviously I agree with it, but um, it was brave. I think what you guys did. Yeah. You want to elaborate on that a little bit? Jim? Yeah. Yeah. And this really, it came out of, you know, phone calls and emails from our members um, expressing their concerns regarding wolf management and second amendment rights in the state yeah. and and the current trajectory that the state is on um under the leadership of governor walls and so our executive board got together and talked about it and made the decision that we would not participate in the governor's deer opener this year and we have been the the sponsor of that event since it started. Right. We actually got that event started. Exactly. Um, yeah. And so for us to pull out is it's not insignificant. Right. 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 It's it's kind of a big statement of we don't like the road we're going down. We've got two big issues in the state that need to be addressed and we have the members behind us that mm-hmm. that want to see that change. And, and, and those two big issues were last year. Correct. You know, right. we MDHA was on the forefront of that. No matter what you might hear after that, you know, or even at the end of deer season this year, where MDHA already stated that even early in the year. I mean, I think that came out in May, April um, or May. Yeah, April or May. So that was already right on the forefront of you know, well before any seasons had started or anything that had been going out about wolf management or anything else that they MDHA already jumped on board of that almost a good nine months before anybody else had even thought about wolf management. Right. Well, and I, I wouldn't even say jumped on board, you know, it's, that's it's, true. We've been, in my opinion, we've been steering the ship and we made an adjustment, you yeah. know, yep. we, we turned yep. the wheel the other way. Yeah. And that's kind of what your members kind of drove you to, right? Correct. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. We don't do anything um, without our members saying so. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. No, that's pretty cool. That uh, that's good to know some of that information that I'm I'm guessing a lot of people didn't understand or well, yeah, realize even 
what went on. Yeah, it was just a blurb in a newspaper or something. MDJ pulls out of the governor opener and people don't really understand why maybe he did that. Right. Yeah. So it's good to be able to, you know, talk about that a little bit. And I know you, you did some interviews, you know, back, you know, last year that talked about a little bit more that I'm sure people still, you know, need to view and, and understand why and why MDHA did that and what MDHA stands for. So that's, that's good to know. So, yeah, cool. Right. Well, I think with that, why don't we, uh, why don't we take another short little break here and, um, We'll come back with uh, Jared and we'll kind of talk about what MDHA is currently working on and a little bit more like that. So we'll be back in just a few minutes. Wolf.report, citizen science means that you provide the data and we provide the platform. Our website is designed for the citizens, hunters, trappers, and anybody else of Minnesota to easily report wolf encounters and share location data. All right, and we're back from a little quick break there. So... You know, Jared, a little bit earlier, we are kind of elaborating on the Stauber, uh, Stauber thing that I got in the mail. And you did attend the, I'm trying to think of the name of it, the legislative listening, is that correct? Down in Willow River, right? Yeah, yeah. listening session, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, you did attend that. So I know earlier we kind of alluded to it, but we didn't get to talk about it a whole lot. So is there anything you want to add to that or yeah, how'd, how'd that, that go how'd that yeah. go yeah I, I wasn't able to attend myself so yeah it was it was an interesting event um you know i was told it was it was questions from the floor or statements from the floor and everyone would be held to you know a minute minute 30 um starting off right away there were a lot of questions being directed towards myself and and mdha about you know where have we been all these years what are we doing now were you an official guest there it was an open session really but they knew you were there so they were asking a bunch of questions yeah they they knew i was there um and so these these questions they they started flying and i stood up to try to answer the first one and it was immediately I was, you know, <laughs> being talked over or yelled right. at. Yelled right. at. So I, I never really got a chance to respond to any of the questions that, that were asked. Yeah. Um, I do. I do remember seeing a video on that. Um, and I know you were trying to, from what I could tell, you were trying to tell that, you know, MDHA has half the population of the lower 48 or MDHA, Minnesota is half the population of wolves in the lower 48. Correct. Um, you know, I'm assuming what the question was, you know, is the population of, you know, the wolves, like we talked about earlier, you know, the numbers that the DNR has, stuff like that. So, like I said, I saw a video. Um, there's a lot of angry people in that. Um so I guess I guess the question is is you were trying to get out, you know, what were you trying to get out in that in that question, you know, in that message? Yeah, yeah. well there was a, a statement that uh Representative Stauber made that Minnesota has more wolves than any other state in the lower forty eight. Okay. While that statement is tr- is very true, I don't think it really speaks to the severity of the issue. Yeah. Because yes, we have more than any other state. But in reality, we have half of the entire population of the lower 48. There's an estimated official estimation of 6,000 wolves in the lower 48. Okay. Minnesota's at about 2,900. Right. So we have half. Yeah, so that's pretty crazy to even understand right when right, you go by land mass. Yeah. Right. right and so when you now have federal judges saying you know this this species needs to be listed under the federal endangered species act because they're not again it goes back to the recovery whether you define yeah. that as historical range or or current habitable but regardless we have a species that some judges think is not recovered yep. nationwide. Sure, they might not be historically, right? Yeah. They might not be. But you have half of the current population in the continental United, St- United States in one state. 
Right, and mostly in the northern part of the state. Correct. Right. Half, half, half of the one state. state. Yeah. Half yeah. of forty percent of one state. Right. Which is pretty sad because most of that's from Highway Two North. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. And so that state should be able to make their own management decisions. Yeah. And you that's what hope. we're arguing for. Right. You know, and that's what I I go back to all the time when I'm I'm talking with legislators and they they're against you know, delisting the wolf or returning management to the state, right? The first question I ask them is, do you have faith in our current agencies to manage our wildlife populations? Right. You know, the DNR. Can the DNR do the job they were hired to do? And every one of them says, yes, they're very qualified. They, They can manage our wildlife. Yep. So let them. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, why not let them? Obviously, they they manage, you know, the white-tailed deer herd. Um, they manage, you know, the bear, fish, uh, every species. Yeah, you know, I mean, they, they still even manage some hunt. elk in northern Minnesota, which is yeah, crazy. And, and moose. Right. I mean, they used to. When I was younger, you could hunt moose. Right. I mean, you can't anymore unless you're part of a tribe, but... Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's something good to go on, you know, even, you know, with that. So, so alluding to that and, and people from what I could see in, in the short little video clip that I saw, obviously um, the whole session, listening session wasn't videotaped. The whole thing wasn't, or at least not that I could, you know, participate in. Um, But at what I could see was just very negative comments towards you yourself and or MDHA, I mean, it sure seems like you've been attacked more than anybody, which is, right. uh, which I don't quite understand because obviously you're speaking for an organization. Um, and so was there anything else, you know, that you can remember from that night or recall that, you know, just some questions that were asked that you might want to, you know, just get on the air or allude to, you know, as to some of the questions you were asked. Yeah. Um, from my memory, there were, oh, two questions I can remember that, again, I, I tried to answer. Right. But they started yelling. Yeah, it seemed could. like you were shut down pretty quick yeah. with with even under that two minute spiel time. Right. You know? right. Yeah. And it's, you know, you ask the question, do you want the answer or not? Right. And apparently they didn't. But <laughs> uh, those two questions were number one about a billboard. Uh, yes. That one of our chapters had put up um, that said oh, 54,000, I think. 54,000 uh, fawns. Yeah. Yep. Wolves, wolves kill 54,000 fawns a year in Minnesota. Um, and there was this, you know, I this statement out there that I made that billboard come down because I – apparently love wolves <laughs> <laughs> which is obviously incorrect <laughs> right. um, we can we can put that out there right now that that was that's false because the billboard was never taken down it wasn't but the it wasn't, issues no. with the billboard were yeah, there were there were some issues with the billboard yeah. uh, specifically the number fifty four thousand fonts um i could not find a single peer-reviewed scientific study that val- validates that number um, and neither could the chapter that put it up and they acknowledged that they did not have that source and they made the decision to not I guess renew their contract with the the billboard company right well and that's where MDHA and you as, as a whole need to you know you're stuck with the science that's always been you know the saying is stick with the science where 54,000 you know fonts it could be less it could be more But the question is, is where did that data come from? And nobody could ever provide the the information where that data was provided. So obviously, MDHA couldn't back that exact number because nobody could prove that it was that number or less or more. I mean, it could be more. Nobody knows. Yeah. But the data just wasn't the data wasn't backed by science. Correct. I guess is even the correct term to say. Yeah. And I've been, you know, I did a number of interviews once yeah, that, did. that billboard went up and and I said in every single one of them, I I one hundred percent MDHA one hundred percent supports the intention behind that billboard that we need wolf management in the state of Minnesota. 
but we can't verify that number right. because they don't have a source. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, and then, you know, a lot of people thought, um, just with social media that the billboard was taken down. It never actually was. It actually ran its course over the, it just expired. Yeah. Over yeah. the month. And then there was three other, two, I, other. two other, two other billboards that were put up, uh, after that, correct? Well, so one more actually went up. There were two other that were proposed. Okay. Um, but we ended up having just one of them run for two months rather than a month each. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Because that other one, the one in between, just again, with the science and everything that MDHA, you know, backs that you, MDHA couldn't exactly promote that one as much as yeah yeah that one said something about um protecting children livestock and pets uh, yeah or, or i children, think it was wildlife and pets yeah protect your children protect your pets children and wildlife i think was yeah. was was what the billboard said yeah so obviously you know with mdha you know wildlife are wolves yeah you know that wolves right. are wildlife wolves are, wolves are wildlife yep and there's no been no um on record of children you know being you know attacked correct yeah yeah and so you know we encourage the chapter not to put that that billboard up because you know, when, when a chapter does something, the media calls me and I have, right. I have to be able to justify the statement that is made. Well, for sure. And I, I knew with that statement, they're going to call and they're going to say, find a case of a child being attacked by a wolf. Yep. Well, in the state of Minnesota, I can't. Right. Right. I, th I think there's been one or two in like Siberia. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's over, I don't know how many years. Right. Um, but then also, so does MDHA not consider wolves to be wildlife? Right. Well, right. absolutely we do. Yeah. They're wildlife like any other species in, in the state, but they need to be managed like every other species. Exactly. So it wasn't even about truly that the other chapter putting up the billboard is that it needed to be not necessarily sponsored, but more um, recognized by MDHA, right. you know, as a whole, as an yeah. organization, because obviously you can't have, you know, chapters putting out their own advertising and stuff like that, which is understandable. So the billboards were never actually taken down. Um, the second one was actually, uh, the third billboard was put up quickly, so that way it just wouldn't be available to everybody because it wasn't again backed by you know mdha correct yeah and that that third billboard I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly what it said but it was something along the lines of uh manage wolves before their prey is extinct or something like yeah, that. yeah something similar to that I, I i don't remember exactly what it was either i remember seeing it but it just it was up there longer, but yeah, it, it, that one didn't seem so controversial. So that was a good thing yeah. um, because it actually stuck to, I guess, if you want to say the science and or just, you know, the norm as to what it should be. Just bringing, um, bringing light to the situation. Right. You know, it wasn't management. meant to elicit so much of an emotional response right. as it was, you know, to get you thinking about the actual facts. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, on, on the short time frame, we didn't have a whole lot of time to tweak that message either. Yeah. But, um, you know, the goal is supporting wolf management, responsible right. wolf management in the state of Minnesota. 100%. The wolf should not be exempt right from the management strategies that we apply to every other species yep just because they're charismatic and fluffy I mean, and cute and whatever they're people a beautiful say. animal right well, they are right nobody can deny that but that doesn't exempt them from responsible management correct right. just like we manage the deer we manage you know bear populations manage you know fish I mean, we manage every aspect of it. In right. And it's just the reality of, you know, today's world. Right. But as humans, we manage these wildlife populations and yep. there's no reason one should be left out. Correct. Uh, it's, I mean, we care about the deer. That's 
and that has to be managed. Them. Yeah, exactly. And one's not more important than the other. No. And and that's something that obviously MDHA has been, like we alluded to earlier, you know, backed for many, many years. Um, you know, so there's no surprise to it. And actually MDHA has wolf management signs, you know, out there. You'll see it in the public here and there, and, and they are available. So, I mean, it's this is nothing new to MDHA. It's just I think it has been brought forward uh you know, with social media, oh, for um, sure. with the public and everything like that. But I still, um, from what I understand, as I still think MDHA has been on the forefront of it from day one, honestly, um, and, you know, have been out there in, in front of at least their members. Um, maybe, you know, not the whole state as far as hunters and everything, um, which MDHA could improve on, obviously. Um, everybody can improve on, but they still have been out there for their members and everything else um so with that being said you know what is mdha working on currently you know in in the current events yeah well our mission um habitat education advocacy and legislation yeah so we do a lot of habitat work around the state um our official grant funded habitat projects are around I, I would I would guess today eighty thousand acres of oh, wow. public land in the state of Minnesota. Wow! Uh, the last time we pulled the numbers, it was seventy five thousand, but we have like twenty some grants going right now. Oh, that's so, cool! That's really so cool. I'm going to estimate eighty thousand. Um, but on top of that, we also have our high, our, our uh, conservation seed program and our conservation apple tree program. Okay, and those aren't factored into that number. Yep. So we give out a lot of apple trees every year. I mean, I couldn't even guess how many bags of conservation seed for food plots that we give out every year. But we're looking at, I would estimate 5,000 acres a year okay. um, in those seed and apple tree programs. Yeah. So a lot of habitat work that, that we work on every oh, that's year. That's awesome. And, and Jim, you've actually uh, been able to receive some of the apple trees, correct? Yes, I yeah. have. Actually, I, I think I got three of you from a couple of years ago. Yeah. And uh, the same year, I bought three from a local um, place that sells them. Nursery. And, yeah. And yep. the only three that are still around are the ones I got from you guys. Well, that's good. Yeah, they're 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 standing test time. I mean, I have lots of deer come in the yard and take them down, and rabbits, and I'm keeping those <laughs> ones alive, surprisingly. Right? No, that's good. Yeah, the the apple tree program and seed program are are um, are very good programs that members. You know, you have to be a member of because it's obviously a membership perk. Um, so that's that's kind of the cool thing um, that we that we get the apple trees and uh, the seed program going and everything like that. So and the chapters are getting more and more involved in it. Um, so that's always always something to really promote. Um, and with that, I know this time of year, springtime, I know we talked about it. The, the last episode is our our sons, you know, were part right. of Four Corn Camp. Uh, yeah. four and they're going back one. again this year. And they're going to go back this year. Yeah, they've got signed up for Deportage, um, which is out of uh, Hackensack area. Hackensack, yeah, yeah, which is really cool. Um, and so that's really neat. So you want to elaborate on kind of the Four Corn program and everything? Yeah, yeah. That brings us to uh, that second part of our mission, which is edu education. Um, so our Four Corn camps, to date, we've sent, well, last time I pulled the numbers was about a year ago and that was 15,000 kids yeah. uh, youth through our four corn camps so it's obviously more now um, but it's a it's a great opportunity for our youth to be exposed to well one to get their firearm safety right that's a big um, thing that it's is huge. great it's yeah. huge mm -hmm. right they get firearm safety as part of their camp um, but also get to learn you know the basics of white-tailed deer ecology of hunting ethics um and really just how to be a, a good steward of of the environment right um so four corn camps are are great we're also trying to expand our education programs through um you know partnerships like we have with wolf report um 
to get more people involved in the issues that matter. Yeah. Um, and then I'm doing some, I'm calling them fireside chats, but doing some of those every once in a while just to talk yeah. about the hot, the hot topic of the hour. Right. I'm sure know. the members appreciate that. Right. Yeah, I hope so. Um, otherwise, I'm just wasting my time. <laughs> no. Well, I know I listened to the last one and then uh, read your article in the, uh, I believe it was a winter White Tails magazine um, about, you know, kind of the wolf management and and uh, your fireside chat really um, combined. If you could read the article and watch the fireside chat that you did, that was really um well, it's just really good to be on the record about yeah. some, some oh, things exactly. you know, as an organization. As to where you stand and the organization stands mm-hmm. and everything else. So that was really eye-opening on a lot of things and a lot of issues that some of the members, you know, if they're not active, truly active, active, you know, may not know as to where MDHA stands as a whole um, and stuff like that. So, no, that's, that's really good information. Yeah, especially with all the disinformation out there. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There is quite a bit of that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, we've all trudged through it. <laughs> yep, that's for sure. And I, and I do see that uh, that is where um, MDHA uh, tries to stay out of all that, um, stay on the positive end of it, uh, which is great. Obviously, you know, we we pride ourselves on on that and not getting down in the – Well, stick to your mission. Good stuff. Yeah, Get exactly. things done. I mean, yeah. you can sit around and argue all you want, but you ain't getting anything done doing that. Right. Yep. Um, so with that, is there, you know, anything else you want to add or, you know, maybe why should people be a member of MDHA, you know? Yeah. Well, as a, a hunter conservationist, I personally believe that I have this not only desire, but need to give back to the land, the species, the the people that helped me to accomplish my goals in, in hunting and, and conserving wildlife, right? Yeah. Um, so I think becoming a member of a conservation organization, whether that be MDHA, Pheasants Forever, Trout Unlimited, uh, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, I mean, there's so many great conservation organizations out there. Right. And I think. I think we all want to give back to them or back to the landscape, but I think it goes a step further in that we, it's kind of a responsibility, you know, if if we're going to be a responsible harvester of that resource, we need to help cultivate that resource. Oh, for sure. Um, And I, I don't personally know in organization that does it better than MDHA. And the right. thing that really sets MDHA apart is every dollar that we raise, every dollar we spend is in Minnesota, right? We yeah. raise dollars in Minnesota, we spend dollars in Minnesota, and that's to benefit Minnesota habitat, Minnesota hunters, and Minnesota residents, right? Yep. I don't care if you hunt or not. If you just want to go out on public land and find a peleated woodpecker, MDHA has played a role, likely played a role in building the habitat for that peleated woodpecker to be there. Yeah, and that is, that's pretty cool. You can't say that about a bunch of you know, different organizations oh, um, or sure. even state organizations. Honestly, you know, I don't, I don't know of too many state organizations where the money stays within the one state. You know, I mean, you look at Rocky Mountain Elk. I mean, they're obviously mainly in Rocky Mountains, but they do have, you know, public land here. We do a lot. MDHA does a lot with them on public land, but obviously, you know, the money, kind of you know moves around um but where with mdha the money stays here right you know you can't say that about a whole lot of organizations that are in this state where the money stays right. within minnesota yeah and there's not too many places these days where you can give back like you can with mdha yeah particularly to the state of minnesota oh for sure for sure and you guys are just a great i think resource for people to do that an easy way to do that Yep, exactly. You know, and then that's where, you know, a, a call for action would be 
<laughs> the more members, the better, because obviously the more members, the more voice, the more, you know, the more you can push to the DNR to, you know, have s- certain rules and regulations right. and the more, you know, you can push them. Right. Yeah. Get active. Join, join, take part. I mean, you can uh, push, push these organizations to do the things you want if you are actually an active member. Right, because what is there, 60, 60 chapters in the NBHA? Pretty yeah, close to it. 60, 61, I think. Yeah, somewhere right around there. So, I mean, get active with your with your local chapter. Get your kids a four corn camp. You know, Absolutely. Um, be part of the be part of the membership. Be active with the chapter. Do you know hides for habitat? You know, donate. Just you know, go to your the family. meetings to start with. Exactly. Go to the meetings so that way in your local community alone, it's amazing what they can do. I mean, your local chapter can support your archery program. They can support, uh, you know, the school archery program, the school trap shooting program. Right. I mean, that's a big thing. Trap shooting is growing leaps and bounds over the past few years. I mean, it is crazy how much it has grown. Um, and then just... I mean, it's just amazing what MDHA can do for your local community um, with these programs that they provide. Right. I think it's important to get the kids involved in as many ways as possible because they're just not doing it as much as like when I was a kid. Right. There's too many other, I don't know, obstacles, but um, too many other attention suckers. Yes, exactly. You know, I mean, our my kid alone you know i mean (laughs) he's always on his xbox and and uh switch or whatever which which i was too as a kid because that really came out when when i was younger but it just you know you still got to get him outdoors and that's where mdha really strives at with the younger you know with the younger crowd to help push them to get outdoors and we need everybody to get outdoors not even if you're you know 12 13 14 15 um you know even you know, adult hunters. I know there's other programs that the DNR sponsors there that obviously MDHA can get involved, you know, to sponsor, you know, older hunters, you know, and hunters of any age to get involved because obviously we're losing, not necessarily that we're losing, but people just aren't getting into it as much as what they used to. And that tradition is, it's on the downward turn for right now, but obviously as history repeats itself, it'll come back. But as of right now, well, and I think that's you know, where NHA's habitat program helps too. They get oh, people to go sure. hunt because I think that's a barrier. Is you know we grew up where hunting we land. we had hunting land. Our, our yeah. families hunted. Where there's a lot of people, I think, in a lot of parts of the state that don't have that. And I think that's a, a barrier to entry. Is you know they'd like to get into hunting, but they honestly don't know where to go. And I think that's where the habitat programs or MDHA help because. You know, you're giving people a place to go hunting. Oh, for sure. Them have places to go hunt. Yeah. That public land. Yep, exactly. And the good thing about MDHA, Jared, is, um, you know, as a member, you have a voice, you know, especially when you're active with the yeah, chapter. Yeah, you have a vote, don't you? Yeah, I mean, you have a vote. You have a voice as to what MDHA does as a whole, correct? That's absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's... You know, your voice is actually heard with some organizations. You're a number. You're just a member number. You know, it it, it doesn't matter how active you are. You're just a number. Yeah, you get a sticker and that's about it. Exactly. They do what they they're going to do. Yeah. To where with MDHA, you, you're an active member. You're more than a number because you have a voice as to how your chapter and how the organization goes as a whole as to what the issues that MDHA, yeah. you know, goes with. So, yeah. I mean, if I, when I go to the Capitol, I'm going there on behalf of our members yeah. and that's, that's how they voted. And it's, that's how I'm required to advocate, right? Right. It's I don't go to the Capitol with a personal agenda. I go there on behalf of our members and you know, hunters in general, I would like to think, because yep. our members are hunters. So that's what I'm there to advocate for. And it's it really gives you a voice to become a member. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So with that, um, you know, a good call to action would be to look into MDHA. You know, become, become a, a member. member. Yeah, do it exactly. I mean, why wouldn't you? Help out. You know, I mean, what is a membership? Thirty-five dollars nowadays. Thirty-five dollars a year. I yep. mean, come on. You know, that's not bad. 
you know, and, and you get a magazine too. I really like the magazine. Yeah. Yeah. You get a magazine and that is full of really cool articles and, um, talks about what MDHA does, you know, all the time with their, you know, chapters and everything else. So, so that's something to really look into. Um, but yeah, I would say look into becoming an MDHA member, you know, do do a little bit of research on that, you know, check out Wolf Report, you know, if you have, what was on camera or anything, share them. you know, share them because that'd be great. Because that obviously helps the cause of, uh, of one, everything one of the causes. For. I mean, yeah, it's it's a popular one right now, right? But. For sure. So I think that'll I think that'll do it for uh, for this episode of uh, Down the Barrel. So what Jared, do you think? You're gonna come back anytime. Happy to happy to join you guys. Yeah, careful what you wish for. We're right, make you come back. <laughs> well, it, it sure makes us seem a lot smarter than what we are. Yeah, definitely gives us a little more credibility. Yeah, right? for sure. So next time, hopefully, uh, we'll kind of look in, look into you know what we can do next time. Um, maybe we'll bring Jared back, talk a little bit about some other issues, a little bit more about MDHA. Obviously, hit on the. Uh, Wolves topic and, and everything else. No, I'm sure. We'll check back in. Yeah. Maybe we'll have Taylor Swift on. Who knows? <laughs> well, if the Chiefs win, we definitely will. You think so? Is that who she's dating? Some Chiefs guy? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Travis Kelsey. Oh, yeah. I yeah. suppose. Of course you don't know. I don't care. Yeah. Like you don't, you don't said, bleed red. Purple. Yeah. You bleed purple. That's right. I bleed red. Right. I'm, I'm just happy there's no green there. <laughs> that, yeah, green, any shade of green. Let's right. put it that way. Any right. shade of green. Um, but yeah, all right, guys. Well, tune in until next time. So, um, are we heading to the range? Yet? I think so. I think we're going to hit the range, and uh, w- you know, we might even shoot that six five. Did he bring the six five? I, I think. So. Well, we'll have to check his truck. I'm, Did you bring I'm, it? I'm still here. Oh yeah, <laughs> I did bring the six five. Forgot but, he was still here. <laughs> right, 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 yeah. But no, I I brought the thirty out six. I oh got wow, the, I, I got, got the mini guns. mini fourteen. Nice. Uh, what did I bring? A couple handguns. Cool. Well, yeah. maybe we'll, we'll get some, some photos fun. at least. You know, because it takes a lot to uh, transfer all this out to the range. So yeah, no doubt. Maybe we'll get a few photos. See what it's all about, and heck, maybe we'll bring you back for a short episode next time just to talk about the range that we're doing. Yeah, no doubt. Sounds for sure. good. All right, guys. Well, tune in we'll until next, you next time, time, and uh, we'll catch you later. Happy Super Bowl Sunday. Yeah, we'll talk to you later, Jared. Appreciate it, buddy. Thank you. Have a good one. Views expressed by Jimmy and Dino or podcast guests are solely their own and do not represent the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association and Wolf.Report.